Welcome to the Raised with Jesus podcast, 10 minutes every day where the life of Jesus meets yours. We've got your daily Bible reading for May 10th, 2019, looking at Acts chapter 20, the first portion. Beginning in verse 1. After the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and encouraged them. After saying goodbye, he left to go to Macedonia. After he had gone through those areas and had spoken many words of encouragement to the people, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. Because a plot was made against him by the Jews, just as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy, along with Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and within five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul spoke to the people. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were gathered. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus. He was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking for a long time. When he was sound asleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, bent over him, threw his arms around him, and said, Do not be alarmed, because he is alive. Then he went upstairs, broke bread, and ate. After talking for a considerable time until dawn, he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had arranged it this way, since he was intending to travel there by land. When he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. From there we set sail. We arrived off Chios the next day. The day after that we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day we came to Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in the province of Asia. He was in a hurry to be to Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. This is the word of our God. Acts chapter 20, you notice this is another we portion where Luke um, Luke joins them, probably up there in Philippi, Macedonia area. And, uh, and Luke, of course, keeps a detailed travel log of all the sailing and all the travel that they go by by sea. At the very beginning of this chapter, the rioting in Ephesus finally comes to an end. And Paul, um, Paul had spent two years there. He had probably even, he had probably even traveled by boat, uh, for a brief period of time directly across the Aegean Sea to Mas- to, um, to Corinth. But we know that from Ephesus was where he was when he wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and then possibly a lost third or even also fourth letter to the Corinthians. Uh, from Ephesus during this time. So he's he's been over there, and now he wants to walk over there by land and follow along the road where he had traveled on his second missionary journey and hopefully encourage the churches along the way without causing ruffling too many feathers as he's passing through. And so in verse 1, saying goodbye, he left to go to Macedonia. Um, check out the show notes for a little bit of a map because we're going from basically Turkey and he goes all the way up to the Straits of Bosporus, you know, Constantinople or Istanbul, and then across those straits um, over to the portion just north of Greece and then all the way down through Macedonia and the Greece mainland until he arrives all the way down in Corinth. So it's it's not a small journey, but it's, um, it's something that he's done before um, on his previous missionary journey when he planted those churches and started those churches. So Luke um, Luke kind of concludes that idea, verse 2, after he had gone through those areas, talking about, you know, Troas and and um, the Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. After he had gone through those areas and had spoken many words of encouragement to the people, he came to Greece, really specifically talking about arriving at Corinth, and he stayed there three months. And as Paul is going through this area, um, this is talked about in 
especially in 2 Corinthians, but it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians as well, that during, during those two years Paul has been at Ephesus, um, he is, he's organizing a collection for God's people because there's going to be a famine in Jerusalem. And God's people among the Gentiles here are, are getting together a collection or an offering to help offset the, the cost of food and to store up some food probably to provide for the believers in Jerusalem. And this is, this is the project that he's taking care of right now as he goes through the area and then especially in verses two through six um, when we've got this list of people from different different congregations in different cities that's really what's going on that he's um he's been collecting this offering and he's the each congregation has entrusted a uh, a man to help carry this offering all the way to Jerusalem so that it's on the up and up and there are no allegations of mishandling or impropriety. And so that's kind of in the background because, because that entire time of two years at Ephesus wasn't wasn't slow. It wasn't wasted time. He wasn't just sitting around or even even just preaching. He's also organizing a larger project. And what we have right here is the, the collection. And we'll kind of, after we get to um, bring Paul back all the way to Palestine, then we'll, we'll get to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And we'll have to rewind just a little bit, but it makes sense. Um, so then we have Eutyches. Eutyches up in the third floor, and he falls out the window. Um, poor guy had probably been working all day. And then it's, you know, nice and warm up there and lit by candlelight. And because um, they didn't have electric lighting, obviously. And, and Paul keeps on talking and talking. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, obviously I don't fall asleep in church anymore. But as a kid... Um, falling asleep for like an evening Lenten service or Advent service was often the most peaceful little nap that I would ever have. Just kind of dozing off and doing the old head bob thing. That's what Eutyches does. And he falls, or Eutychus, and he falls out the window three stories down and, uh, and probably breaks his neck, something like that. And, um, and everybody is distraught. And Paul goes down, puts his arms around him, and raises him from the dead. Do not be alarmed because he is alive. And perhaps there is something worth mentioning here. You know, um, Paul wasn't necessarily the most bombastic or interesting, even, of preachers. He put somebody to sleep. He killed somebody with his preaching. We kind of joke about that sometimes. He wasn't the most interesting of preachers, necessarily. I mean, we hear him preach. We have a couple of his sermons recorded. But when he you know, goes on for a few hours, he's lecturing late into the night. Maybe that's a different story. But we remember that God works through his gospel. And yes, uh, people are people. <laughs> and, and there may be some, some resistance to somebody who is uninteresting to follow or, or seems detached and unmoved and unimpacted by the gospel. And so as a pastor, you know, we try to try to preach an interesting sermon, but leave the results up to God and try to preach in such a way that is engaging and, and to be transparent enough so that people see, um, see how God's word affects our emotions, but not, not dissolving into a blubbering emotional mess either. <laughs> and so there's, there's kind of that, that that delicate line to walk. Like, how do I, how do I demonstrate God's grace to me in this? And how do I convey to these people exactly the emotional response that God wants us to have? Um, you know, we talk about teaching that really touches the, that touches the knowledge and the feelings and the action or speaks to knowledge, feelings, and actions, or how do I carry it out? And preaching is very similar. Knowledge, you know, looking to convey some knowledge because, because that's the essence of Christianity. It's not just encouragement, but it's encouragement that has strong scriptural basis. And it has teaching that is ap applicable, and as well as teaching that might not seem applicable or practical at the very beginning. You know, talking about the humiliation of Jesus Christ might be like, okay, pastor, let's move on from that. I think I get it. 
but you can't talk about the practical pain and, and suffering in this life, at least not profitably, unless you first understand the humiliation of your Savior, who, being in very, very nature God, set aside the full and free, or the full and regular use of his divine power, glory, and honor for you and for me. And so, when we talk about preaching, we talk about um, making sure that Christ is glorified, that God's truth is conveyed, that Christians are encouraged with the Word of God, that the Word of God leads to natural natural effects um, upon one's emotion, and you know, exciting parts are exciting, and and um, and then just putting the focus where it belongs. And if somebody falls asleep, well, they fall asleep, and we'll try next time. So as you go about your day, take a moment to thank God for the faithful pastors that you've had in your past and even in your present. The faithful pastors who, whether they were interesting or boring or somewhere in between, pointed you to Jesus. Because that's the gospel message. Because that's what God uses to build churches. Not the personality of a pastor, but the person of Jesus. You can find us Sunday morning, 2250 South Hollandsvania Road, Maumee. You could also follow us on Instagram at Raise with Jesus. God bless your day.